All right, Alexander, we've got some uh, some statements from the Kremlin. Uh, specifically, I was reading a lot of stuff from Lavrov. He gave a, a big interview to uh, RT, actually. Um, and on a side note, we got some news that Berlin is now forcing the EU satellite operator to take RT's uh, German TV broadcast off air. That's just a side, a side narrative after YouTube took down their, their channel. The next step was that the broadcasters would take down uh, RT's German language TV channel. But anyway, back to Lavrov and the interview with RT. Uh, Lavrov did say that Russia is not looking for war, but uh, for conflict, for possible conflict, but they are preparing. And it looks like the Kremlin is taking a very hard line with everybody involved, whether it's uh, NATO, uh, Europe, uh, Germany, in this case, they said they're going to hit back at Germany. We have some diplomats that, that were expelled as well. And, of course, you have um, the United States. On another side narrative, Alexander, I was reading an article where Ukraine has said that they will successfully derail Nord Stream 2. They are very, very confident that not only will they, will they derail Nord Stream 2, but the gas will continue to flow via Ukraine. They feel like they've got all the leverage in the situation. So a lot of a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where where do you want to begin? Well, let's begin with Ukraine. And I mean, they said this before about Nord Stream two. They, they've sort of they, they've become excited because of the certification issue, the fact that there's been this delay in certification. I think that they are uh, deluding themselves about this, not so much because. You know, I expect Nord Stream 2 to be certified. On balance, I think it will be certified. I think the certification process will be completed around June. And I think the Russians think it will be too, because uh, apparently they've now filled the second string of Nord Stream 2 with gas. So I, I think that the certification process will be successfully completed. And the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has said as much. But I accept, you know, politics are complicated. There's all kinds of things going on over Nord Stream 2. I think there's a chance that it won't be. I accept that. But where I think Ukraine is completely wrong is that I think they imagine that if they succeed in stopping Nord Stream 2, that means that their position as a transit state will be preserved. And I think about that, they are completely wrong. There is no sign that the Russians at the moment are, have any intention of negotiating another transit deal with Ukraine. Um, they're building another pipeline now to China, power of Siberia 2, which diverts gas, which would normally be intended for Europe, to China. And I think you're going to find after 2025 that Ukraine's position as a gas transit state ends. So I, I think that the Ukrainians are deluding themselves. I think it's important to remember that there is a political and economic crisis in Ukraine at the moment. We've talked about this already, about how Zelensky is talking in paranoid terms about coups and he's bringing charges against his political opponents, Poroshenko, Medvedchuk and all the rest. And they're undoubtedly very nervous about the strategic stability talks that the Americans are apparently preparing to engage the Russians with in, in, uh, with in January. So I think for all of these reasons, they're basically talking up their prospects as the situation for them becomes bleaker. So that's, that's, what, I think, that's what I think about that. But let's go instead and let's focus, no, let's not get diverted by the important secondary issues, this campaign that the German government has been waging against RT, which it has been for a very long time, by the way, and against the Russian media. Germany has a very controlled media environment, by the way. But let's, let's not focus too much on that. Let's look instead at what the Russians are saying. And the Russians are not only taking an exceptionally hard line which is what Lavrov was saying in that long interview with RT. But his boss, Putin, calls together all the military. There's a big meeting uh, um, at the Ministry of Defence um, just uh, a, a day or so ago in which Putin spoke in absolutely categorical terms. 
that Ukraine's NATO membership is out of the question, that the situation in Ukraine poses a direct danger to Russia itself. He raised this, I think, alarmist prospect of Ukraine acquiring hypersonic missiles and threatening Russia with them. And he made it clear that would not be tolerated. And he spoke about Russia being willing to take a tough response if those kind of threats were ever realized. And he also said that Russia had nowhere to retreat to. And talking, of course, to military officials in that way, the implications, it seems to me, are very clear about the fact that, as I said, the West is now very close to crossing Russia's red lines in Ukraine. Russians want them recognised. Lavrov says Russia wants them recognised. But both Lavrov and Putin are in effect saying if they're not recognised, then there will be much higher tension in Europe and a real prospect of a war there which could end in disaster for Ukraine and for the West. Well, um, if they're not recognized, given all the, the videos we've done on the situation in Ukraine, the domestic situation, coupled with all the videos and analysis we've done with the situation in the Biden White House and the, the vacuum of power and the mess that is the Biden White House, it won't take much to uh, trigger the Russians, will it? No, it won't. And I mean, that's the warning they're giving now. I mean, you know, we are we are now in a we are now in a potential conflict situation. I mean, th they've gone out of their way to make that absolutely clear. I mean, you know, you have to read Lavrov's and Putin's words to see how, you know, how what a strong line they're taking. And I, I don't think that this is fully accepted or understood in the West, I don't think there's any real understanding in the West of how alarming and dangerous the situation with Russia now is becoming. And I think that the administration, which is so divided and so chaotic and so weak, with the president himself, who probably doesn't want a war for all kinds of reasons, but who has great difficulty asserting his authority and whose political position in the United States is so weak and who is so weak for all sorts of other reasons. Um, with a president in that kind of position, it's debatable, it's very debatable, whether um, a settlement can come um, soon enough for the Russians and one clear enough for the Russians to accept. I mean, Putin was talking about a definite time frame for a settlement of all these issues. Now, he went out of his way to say, contrary to what some people are saying, that he was not actually giving an ultimatum. But you could say, in a way, that he was not giving an ultimatum yet. <laughs> it's something which, given this rhetoric, could very soon come. And he's had talks, as we know, with the Indians. He had another chat with Indian Prime Minister Modi, just uh, 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 you know, a, a few uh, about a day ago on the phone, he's had a virtual summit meeting with um, Xi Jinping. He's making sure that you know his backers, his diplomatic support, is solid. So he's feeling, and the Russians are feeling, in an increasingly, uh, shall we say, um, confrontational mood. Yeah, but um, it really interesting, just as an aside, as you were describing the Biden White House, everything you said could have just as easily applied to the Zelensky uh, presidency as well. Yeah. When you're describing yeah. a weak president, confused, all the... I mean, at one point I was going to ask you, you speak, are you talking about the Biden White House <laughs> or the Zelensky presidency, to be honest? But uh, yeah. what happens if uh, yeah. if they completely ignore Putin's ultimatums? I mean, what, is, yeah. what does that mean? He, he puts ultimatums as Putin... Do something or does it just right. continue to, right. to float towards, right. towards something? I, I, I don't think that the Russians have a plan to start a war in Ukraine this winter. But having said that, there was a third person who spoke the other day, who was the Russian defense minister, who was Sergei Shoigu. And he could describe a military that is ready for action. Now, I mean, 
I think that there's a lot more weapon systems coming online. We got a whole series of, you know, they're, they're still in the throes of a rearmament program. I think that probably the ideal moment for them to strike, if it came to that, would be about one or two years from now. But I think that, you know, they would be ready. Uh, now, again, they made it very clear, they made it repeatedly clear that they will not themselves initiate anything. They will not take the step of starting military action themselves. They would look to Ukraine or they would look to the West to do something which overtly crosses their red lines. But in a situation where you have a chaotic situation in Ukraine and a chaotic situation in Washington, where the hardliners, far from wanting to pull back, seem to be intent on pushing forward, as you rightly said, it would take only the smallest thing for uh, uh, um, a conflict in Ukraine to start and for the Russian counter response to be overwhelming, as the Russians have said. So they're prepared to they're, they're prepared to wait. They're prepared to bide their time. But if there's no negotiations, then a minor provocation which in the context of negotiations might be, shall we say, parked to one side, could in an absence of negotiations and in a period of severe tension, could easily escalate into an outright conflict. And to be very clear, that would be difficult for Russia because obviously there would be sanctions and all those things. But it would be an absolute disaster for Europe and for the United States because it would face another military debacle, this time on a far bigger scale than the ones it's recently experienced. I mean, Afghanistan would be small potatoes compared to this. And um, in terms of Ukraine, well, the, the kind of Ukraine we've known for the last 30 years, especially the last seven years, would be ended. I mean, it, it would cease to exist in the form that we know. Yeah, final question. If you're a neocon and you're sitting in Washington, if you're in one of these think tanks, if you're a, a Ukrainian hardliner, one of these hardliners that's itching for war, what do you do to start that war? Specifically, what is the one or two or three specific actions you take in order to get Russia to, to, to strike? Well, I think if you're, a neo, if you're a Ukrainian hardliner, you probably want a war as soon as possible. And that's my own personal view about this, because from their point of view, um, they are sensing this enormously strong Russian position and they're becoming increasingly nervous. Um, the, I mean, putting aside the question of Nord Stream 2, they, they've now been told unequivocally that the West will not send troops to defend Ukraine. I mean, that's one of the big things that has come out of the political and diplomatic exchanges over the last few weeks. So, uh, so Ukraine, in effect, is on its own. Now, given that that is so, given that the West is not prepared to defend Ukraine, it's logically never going to admit Ukraine into NATO. And a Ukrainian hardliner must be saying to themselves, given that that is the Western stance, and it seems to be the Western stance across the board, all governments for the moment are signed up to it. There must be a real risk, especially with the Americans beginning negotiations with the Russians in January. There must be a real risk that the Americans will at some point concede and sign us away. So given that that is so, given that we are determined under no circumstances to compromise our project in Ukraine itself, our best bet to try and rescue a collapsing situation is to start a war in the hope that using that war, we can rally support in the West behind us and at least we can retrieve something. And if we fail, if we fail in that endeavour, well, we would at least have the consolation of going down to a glorious defeat rather than to see our position finally and completely eroded away. So that, I think, is the thinking of very hardline people 
in Ukraine. And remember, people like that, people who think in this, I mean, you know, extreme way, they do hold very powerful positions in Ukraine, especially in the National Security and Defense Council, which is the primary military body, the, the, the body that makes the military decisions. So th that's the risk there. The neocons are a different group entirely, even though, of course, they're allied with the Ukrainian hardliners. I think the problem with the neocons is that, as they consistently show, they always underestimate the resistance to whatever project they are intending to launch. So they got Afghanistan wrong, they got Iraq wrong, they got Syria wrong, they got Libya wrong. I think before very long we're going to discover how completely wrong they got Yugoslavia too. All their projects fail. And one of the reasons why they fail is because they consistently overestimate American power and they consistently over, over underestimate the power of resistance of the other side. I think the neocons think one of two things, either that Putin is bluffing and that the Russians are bluffing and that if they press on in Ukraine, they will call his bluff or alternatively, they probably calculate that if there is some kind of a crisis in Ukraine and there is a war there, yes, Ukraine will be defeated. But the sanctions that will be imposed on Russia will be so devastating that the political system there will collapse and the dream, their wet dream of taking over Russia, breaking it up, encircling China, that will finally be achieved. There are neocons who do think in that way. I've read some of the uh, articles that they write. And I, the, the extraordinary thing about them is that they show remarkably little grasp uh, of the economic and military realities and logistical realities. And they've never shown any, any interest in those things because their ideology is such that they always have to believe that the other side is weaker than it is, and that the US and the Western powers are stronger than they are, and that they can dictate outcomes. Because if they admit to the opposite, then of course they have to admit that the entire neocon project is by definition hopeless and has no future. So ideologically, they are incapable of doing that, and for that reason, they have no reverse gear. So I think what the neocons will do in this situation is they will team up with the hardliners in Ukraine and they will push either for Putin's bluff to be called, as they hope, or alternatively, if there is a war for the kind of across the board sanctions that they ache for to be imposed on Russia in the expectation, as I said, that that would provoke uh, economic and political collapse in Russia, which has been their long-term objective all along. So it's a very dangerous situation. I think they are completely wrong. The neocons are completely wrong in that assessment, as they've been uh, wrong in all of their other analyses. But as, this, as we've said so many times, they never learn from their mistakes because their ideology blinds them to it. Yeah, but uh, what would be the one action that they take? Would it be just attacking East Ukraine? Would that be the trigger in your mind? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the Russians have now pushed things up further. So an attack on eastern Ukraine would be a particular... I mean, that would obviously be a Russian red line. I mean, Lavrov essentially said that in that interview with RT that you talked about. And I don't think anybody is in any doubt about that. But it's clear from Putin's words that certain types of arms deliveries to, the, to Ukraine would be for Russia a red line also. If, obviously, hypersonic missiles, which the United States, by the way, doesn't yet even have, if those hypersonic missiles were del delivered to Ukraine, well, that would clearly be a red line and the Russians would act immediately. But if anything else, if heavy weapons... If Abrams tanks, Apache helicopter gunships, uh, um, um, 
you know, self-propelled artillery, missile systems, if anything like that were delivered to Ukraine now. I mean, you know, small weapon systems, Javelin anti-tank missiles, Stinger anti-aircraft missiles, they're not going to change the military picture. They don't really worry the Russians too much. But if those kind of heavy weapons were delivered to Ukraine, the Russians have made it quite clear that as far as they're concerned, that is a red line. And they would, if only because they would interpret deliveries of heavy weapons of that nature as a sign that NATO is preparing to move its infrastructure into Ukraine. And the Russians have made it clear that that is unacceptable. So um, the kind of arms deliveries that some people in the US Congress are now talking about, um, if they were ever greenlighted, far from deterring Russia, as some of those people in Congress appear to think, they would be far more likely to precipitate a war. All right, we will uh, leave it there. The Duran.locals.com, everybody, and Odyssey Bitch Shoot Rumble Super U is where you will find all our videos on those platforms. And go to the Duran shop, use the code Good day and get 10 percent off all merchandise you have a good day mug Alexander, absolutely i've not got i've not got you just got one you'll be really delighted to see that i've got two <laughs> one i have with me always at home this is the one i have when i this is the one i use to drink tea this other one i take with me so specifically now to the gym where obviously i need to drink water whilst I exercise and things like that. And, you know, when I go on picnics, I cannot be parted from my good day mug. So you see how important these are to me. Uh, they are wonderful mugs. I would say anybody who wants a good day should certainly have one. At All least right, one. You can pick those up at the Duran shop. At least one. <laughs> pick those up at the Duran shop. You'll find the link down below as well. Take care, everybody. <laughs>